Mark, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk with you today uh, about the research that you're conducting here at Monash. I wonder if you could just start by talking about one project you're working on at the moment. Um, thank you for having me, Chris, and thanks for this great initiative to start with, you know. Um, before I talk about the research and different projects that I've been involved recently um, into, I'd like to remind you as well that I work as a professional translator and conference interpreter, and this is going to uh, have an impact on what I'm going to say. Um, what I do in terms of research is broadly to look at education and training of um, future, uh, future professionals in translation and interpreting. and. Um, I'm always looking at the way practice can inform research, research can inform training, and training can inform practice. You know, there's this sort of cyclical thing that I'm looking at uh, very often, based on my own practice or on others' um, experience uh, and so on. Um, two things recently I've been involved in. In translation, I've been working on a very interesting book, actually, that was two years ago, but which was the book based on the um, series, uh, the SBS DVD, uh, First Australians, and they turned it into a book a few years later. And because I have um, working for a publisher who's quite interested in these areas and what we call cultural anthropology and things, we decided to translate the book, and, and this is the French version of it. So very interesting, uh, very interesting work because um, it goes, of course, beyond words and beyond purely translating and being interested in the literal aspect of things. The cultural, anthropological, ethnographic aspect of the book was really, uh, really interesting, so and could that's you a good tell example. Us in, in a little bit more detail, then, what, what precisely were you doing on that project? How, how were you bringing your skills to bear? On, on helping that series and those books to be produced? So the idea is that the book was published in English, of course, and people wanted to translate it into French. And so um, it's, uh, it's always, you know, the sort of questions when you're translating is always to wonder what is the function of the translation? Why would we translate that sort of things? How could Francophone readers in the world be interested in this? And so, of course, when you discover, the book is about the history of Australia, you know, written by seven historians, uh, black and white, and it is a book which looks at the history of Australia through the eyes of the uh, Aborigines, uh, or, or the whites who worked with Aborigines uh, over two centuries and a half. So quite interestingly, to reappropriate the text, recontextualize the text for a French audience, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of, of course, research, translation itself, but also myself, you know, becoming more familiar with the Australian history and, and what was behind that. Um, but also, you know, lots of the words used in the book were in Aboriginal languages. So what do you do with this? Do you try to find a translation? Do you keep them uh, as an Aboriginal language in the French text and just put, you know, some sort of explanation in apposition in the text? So th th there's a strategy, and that's always quite interesting to, uh, to, to apply those strategy to a project. And this was the case with this one. Could you tell us about say one one example from the book of, of a decision that you had to make, say, say some text in an original Aboriginal language, what you decided to do with it and why you decided. Um, yeah, when there, when there were occurrences of some Aboriginal language, let's say a sentence said by someone and the translation was given in English at the time, um, what do you do with this? Do you simply keep this uh, it could be um, it could be something that uh, an English reader or an Australian reader would understand or would connect with, but not a French reader. So the idea was sometimes to decide to keep it. Two things in translation, and we often say that we can we can. Um, um, keep the foreignization or the foreign in the text as a strategy of foreignization or there's a, a, a strategy of domestication if you want. Sometimes you could decide to bring the text to the audience and the audience doesn't move or sometimes you have the audience, uh, you require the audience a, a movement towards the text or towards the culture and in this case that's what I did. We kept lots of Australianisms, uh, we decided to keep lots of the occurrences of the Aboriginal language when they were and keep them so that the French reader could also, if you want, embrace that, that part of the of the of the history and of the culture, so very interesting project um, uh, that one. Um, in interpreting, because that's um, uh, mainly what I've been focusing on for the last three years, uh, doing lots of research on training in interpreting. Uh, and one uh, aspect in particular was working with um, digital pen technology. I was lucky a few years ago to uh, be shown um, completely by chance a new technology called digital pen, where the pen, quite interestingly, um, allows, when you use it, to film what is written and to synchronize this with, with what is being said in the room. So that's that's this very simple pen here, which looks like a pen. Um, there's a very 
a powerful microphone here. There's an infrared camera here, and it's a computer. It's a little, bit, a little computer. You use some paper which looks like normal paper, and it's normal paper, except that it's microchipped. So it's a little notebook. Uh, the pen is a normal pen with a cartridge, but it's also a computer, as I said. And what you do is that when you write, when you start a session and you write with it, the pen will record what is being said in the room, and at the same time, synchronize with what you are writing. So which means you have a way to uh, put words in relation of what is being said in the room. What is quite interesting about that is that it was invented by an American company for secretaries actually who take minutes in meetings and when they want to review their notes they can, you know, on clicking on a word they can see what's happening because you can upload all this on your computer. So I was lucky to be presented that and very, very interestingly early in my playing with the pen I realized that it could be excellent tool, an excellent tool for um, training uh, interpreters in consecutive interpreting, specifically note-taking. Because so far, uh, note-taking in consecutive interpreting was limited to having the product of notes. So let me explain this. Um, when you have a speaker delivering a speech in a language, the interpreter who will be interpreting consecutively, and we're not talking about simultaneous interpreting here, but consecutively, will take notes, and when the speaker is done, the interpreter will deliver the speech in another language based on the notes. Could, could you just for those of us not familiar with the difference between simultaneous and consecutive, could you just spell that out? Okay, so simultaneous interpreting is that you've got, let's say, a speaker delivering a speech in a language and you've got an interpreter from a booth or with equipment speaking at the same time uh, with a little lag, lag, if you want, or decalage as we call it in our profession, and we'll be delivering the speech in, in the other language. With consecutive, you do not have any equipment uh, and you are listening to the speech first take notes, and then deliver the speech from the notes, which means that in training there's a lot of time which is spent on note-taking techniques, uh, and students and trainees must, and interpreters must develop their own, if you want, um, um, note-taking uh, systems and things. But so far in training, we had only had access to the product of notes, which means you've got an interpretation, you look at the notes at the end and you said, okay, there were issues, there, this and that. With this pen, which allows you to synchronize what is written with the audio captured in the room, for the first time I thought, oh my God, we have access to the process of notes. And so I started developing pedagogical sequences years ago and um, implemented that in the classroom, writing quite a lot, uh, getting funding from um, an, a translation agency uh, who wanted to know if interpreters would be um, trained with this thing or if we could develop things. So that was one aspect. And the other application that I developed after that was the fact that we could move towards a hybrid mode of interpreting, which is not consecutive and not simultaneous, but which is a mix of both. How would that work? You would have a speaker delivering a speech. The interpreter would take notes with this pen, and this pen would record the speech, if you want. When the speaker is done, so we are still in a consecutive setting, but when the speaker is done, the interpreter, through the paper i shown before, and through the features of this pen, could click on the word, put a little ear set from the pen, and listening to the speech a second time could deliver a simultaneous interpretation, but having already heard the, speak, the speech, and having, if you want, clarified a few things. So again, I've been doing um, one pilot study on that, and, and try to work on this mode, which had been already explored by other researchers, but not with digital pen technology. And so uh, I called it conseximal, which is a, a, a good abbreviation for both modes, if you want. And we are trying at the moment to implement that during training, actually, as a sort of step between consecutive and simultaneous, where students who are used to consecutive could move towards simultaneous interpreting using this little tool. So these are the two projects I've been working on recently. That is a wonderful piece of equipment. Um, and it, it appears to me, someone looking in from the outside, that it would have huge application Absolutely. in lots of different areas. It's being used in education by all sorts of researchers, teachers, or whatever. Imagine someone who wants to, I don't know, draw an atom in a class in, in, you know, and, and telling students, okay, and then you film what you're, what you're drawing, and at the same time you're explaining, which means people uh, discover that hugely used as well by journalists, you know, interviewing people and taking notes. So any, any ethnographers, anyone doing some field work, interviews and things like that should definitely and would definitely be interested with this. Yeah. Could we now take a step back from these two really interesting, very specific projects? And I'd, I'd love to get an overall view of your research as a whole, uh, whether there are any particular questions that you're 
continually pursuing any particular problems you've been trying to solve over the, the, the time that your research has been progressing, or how you try to sum up the work that you do um, as, a, as a whole landscape rather than looking at one, or, one feature or another of it. Yeah, as I, as I told you in, in the introduction, the idea is that I'm trying to look at the way practice, research and training form some sort of, of, of cycles, if you want, and what the synergies are between them. So that's what people call sometimes practice-led research, practice-based research. I prefer, I think, the practice-informed research, uh, which is used in different areas. So I'm looking mainly at training of professionals in the 21st century. The 21st century is a different context of work for translations and uh, translators and interpreters, uh, because of technology, because of um, the glo because of globalization, because of many many things. Translators and interpreters work in very different contexts today. So I do believe, like many others, that of course training has been impacted by these changes, and we have to be very careful in an institution, in a university environment to be sure that we take that on board when we train, when we train students. This happened at the same time where um, the role of universities, in my view, has changed a lot in the last 30 or 20 years as well. Um, universities have now, you know, we have terms we have to cope with, like employability, like, you know, uh, is there any professional training in what, are we talking about training and education? So in the, in the, in the work that I'm doing at Monash in training, which is where I base my research on, uh, we are really aware of this, um, if you want, dichotomy between the academic and the professional, but we try to embrace both aspects of the uh, uh, of, 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 of this dichotomy, and we try to implement activities and things in the program to train interpreters and translators for this new context. Um, and so the research that I do is that. The, the thread you will find in the research that I have is, okay, how can I, based on my own experience, I still practice you know, in many different fields. Uh, I can work for governments in the mining industry as an interpreter. I do translation, as you saw. I can work uh, uh, for Antarctic science recently for different um, international organizations. And, um, and I'm aware of certain things happening in, in, in the industry. I'm very well connected with partners and with stakeholders in the industry. And uh, we try to bring that dimension into training and to me it goes to research as well because it's always interesting to, to really explore what is being done through practice and then turn that into pedagog pedagogical activities and these pedagogical activities will if you want form train shape the professionals of tomorrow so that's going back through practice actually so this cycle is quite interesting so I've published a few book chapters in the last few years and articles on that, you know, whether it is the digital pen technology, whether it is what sort of translation text can you use, whether it is bringing in elements from the industry into our assessment grids, for example, or things like that. And that's quite, that's quite interesting. Thank you. I'd love to push you just a little bit more on, on the relationship between the so-called the professional and the academic, because I, I agree with you that, that that is very often set up as a dichotomy, and it's, it's very frequently a false dichotomy. Uh, people try to put a particular field of research or a particular academic into one of those two boxes and then assume that they have nothing to, to say to the other one, which is a very naive way of looking at the work that we do. Um, I'd, I'd love to ask you about that in relation particularly to translation and interpreting as a, a research discipline. Um, there have been papers published recently, one of them here out of Monash, one of them in the UK coming from the, the Open Humanities uh, group, uh, that have put forward very persuasive uh, and rigorously argued um, cases for the, the status of translation and interpreting uh, as an academic discipline, um, which have been uh, wonderful to see. But I think there's still quite a lack of understanding in, in some quarters over what precisely it is that translators and interpreters do. And to, at the risk of insulting you, um, I think there's still an opinion among, sadly, among some people that, that translation is basically looking at words in a dictionary, finding the one-to-one -one equivalent, uh, and producing uh, an equivalent text in the second language through, through the use of a dictionary. I would, I would love to hear from you um, how you, you would respond to, to that very naive and misguided uh, understanding of what it is that you do. And if you could paint us, please, a, a fuller picture of what is involved in translation uh, over and above simply opening a dictionary. 
Well, that's a very, very complex question, and you're right. There's a naive um, a perception uh, uh, on, on those things, but it's also hard to answer the question. I think definitely we'll say and we'll, we'll, we'll state and advocate that re translation studies is a real discipline, and translation should be seen as a research you know, um, discipline as well. Um, and when I say translation, that, um, um, of course, um, encapsulates interpreting uh, uh, as well. Um, Look, I think that there are two things. The first thing is that what is translation? There are people who think translation, as you said, through words and through some sort of pedagogical activity that you use as a linguistic activity to acquire a language. That's one thing. Uh, we do this in different language programs and we use translation as a linguistic activity to learn languages. That's one thing. Many people think that's only that. Of course, when you're a professional, that's not the case. You know, words, of course, we work with words and we have to transpose words and cultures into another language and into another culture. Uh, and I think that's what people do not understand most of the time, is that translation is not a linguistic activity, in my view. This is a communication activity. It's communicating across languages and cultures. And translators and interpreters are communicators. And if you're not aware of that dimension of the work that we do, uh, many people would not understand, of course, what, uh, what, what, what is behind this. Um, let me take an example when we try to illustrate that with students initially when they come to training. And I hope that will answer your question and it will give a, a good pathway to the, to, the, to, to the understanding of that, or a good way to understand this. Um, when we work with students very early in their training, we give them a recipe to translate, a nice pavlova recipe. And we tell them, okay, is it a kiwi and an Australian dessert? That's another story. But you know, okay, this is the Pavlova recipe written in English. You have to translate that into your uh, language, or that in English, but we give you two um, instructions. The one is that you need to provide this translation for a group of 80-year-old ladies who want this uh, dessert for their tea time next, um, next tea time tomorrow, uh, or next tea after afternoon tea tomorrow. Uh, but the second instruction is that we also want this recipe for a group of 10-year-old boys who want to do this as a birthday cake. And of course, with the same source text, with the same activity, which is translating, you will do two very different things, different research, different... And so that's how, in my view, that goes long, long beyond and way beyond um, um, words simply and, 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 and is put into, into something else. Uh, this is an example. But now, in terms of research, yes, of course, translation is research. It's an academic discipline of its own. It belongs to what people call, call the new humanities, I believe, for the last 30, 20 years. Uh, it came from... And it's at the crossroads still of literary studies, cultural studies, creative writing, uh, communication studies, linguistics, psycholinguistics, neurolinguistics, cognitive studies. It's at the crossroads of all these things because both in interpreting and translation, uh, there are those. But you know, whether you translate, whether you interpret, there's always preparation, there's always research, there's always critical, um, you know, thinking behind that. Um, there's, there's always an academic discipline to the thing, of course. So, yes, we would definitely advocate that translation is a discipline, translation studies is a discipline um, of its own, and, that, um, and, and we see that everywhere today. And, um, and people need to understand that it is not a linguistic activity. We're not, you know, the cognitive aspect in interpreting is much more important than uh, the language proficiency. Of course, people have to be proficient in the language. That's, a, that's taken for granted. But all training has nothing to do with the language. The training has to do with the context of work, with the modalities of work, with the modes of interpreting. In translations, that's the same. There are lots of text types translators have to translate, but translators also have now, specifically in the 21st century, to adapt to technology. And, you know, what do you do with translation memory? What do you do with software that helps you, you know, um, to, 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 do, to do this or that in a better way or to translate in a better way? So that, that's, quite a, that's quite a broad, broad field. Um, on top of that, you could see people, you know, looking at, um, you know, doing research on translation and on translators, for example, using eye tracking uh, devices, you know, uh, uh, and, and trying to do research and observe how translators work. So all these things are very important and it's very broad and I think many programs like ours try to put that into uh, into training activities and but reflecting both the academic and the professional needs of course um, so yeah that that's that's an interesting um, that's an interesting mix and that's an interesting juggling all the time between the uh, between the discipline as research and the discipline as practice uh, practitioners help researchers immensely researchers help practitioners and that's where there's an issue is that very often practitioners do not see the benefit of research and I think it's our duty as academics as well to clearly show them that there is a benefit you know um, uh, the research that we do in both translation and interpreting helps uh, professionals and
and and we can we can clearly show that and prove that you know but practitioners have to be have to listen you know to researchers if they can you know that's that's also the, they have to read that we have to make this accessible to them as well which is another story that there has to be a conversation it has to, there absolutely there has to be a conversation absolutely i wonder if i could ask you now about two trends uh, that are present in our society at the moment and how that the discipline of translation and interpreting studies reacts to them. The, the first is sociocultural and the second is technological. The, the sociocultural trend is that there's at least an increasing perception, if not a reality, that English is functioning as an international lingua franca. Um, and the conclusion that, that's drawn from that in a knee-jerk sort of way is that, well, then we, we necessarily have less and less need for translators because more and more people are speaking English. The technological trend is the rise of algorithmic or machine-based translation. I'm thinking particularly of Google Translate, which is something that my students often use to their great detriment. <laughs> and uh, again, people may draw the conclusion, well, Google Translate and, and such systems are improving all the time, they're getting better. Aren't they squeezing uh, translators and interpreters out of the market? I, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the, the world of translating and interpreting is, um, I wouldn't say responding to, because I don't think it's that it's a reactive mode, but, but is working with and through and in relation to those sorts of trends in, in our society at the moment. Again, there's a lot to say on, on both, of course, and I'll try to... Uh, uh, you know, to not not to lose sight of your of your question. Um, so the social cultural aspect of things. Yes, let's say 20 years ago, globalization, people, you know, traveling around, sometimes displaced, sometimes voluntarily, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Cultures meeting with new cultures, and and English becoming little by little a lingua franca. Many people 20 years ago thought that through globalization, yes, we will not need interpreters and translators anymore. Anymore, people will speak English. To the right, at the right level, and will be able to do that by themselves. Big mistake, and we know that because, of course, more interaction between people, more um, uh, movement between goods and services and people all over the world in cultures and languages that had never met before. That's what people need to understand. Economical changes having or seeing middle classes in many, many countries, people having the possibility now to travel to go overseas. To anyway, all these things um, have shown clearly in the last 20 years that there is actually the volume of work to be translated every day has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown in the last 20 years, immensely. Um, the big mistake was specifically from Anglo-Saxon countries thinking that, okay, we are safe, you know, we are the ones speaking English, everyone will speak our language soon. And people close language programs, translation and interpreting programs, to the, to the point that now there is a real shortage of English translators and English interpreters, you know, with the, with the native, um, or native speakers of English. Anyway, that's another story. But interestingly, yes, most of the world speaks or can speak English today, but that's what we call, and you may have heard, globish, you know, global English, that notion that, yes, you you can converse with someone in a in a pub or, or in a museum or whatever. But what happens when you have you know a, a politician uh, speaking to an audience, a scientist? Uh, what happens when you have I don't know sportsmen you know commenting on their game? Uh, what what happens when you need to translate that legal contract because you're buying a house in that very different country at the other end of the planet? Or what happens uh, you know uh, when you need that business um, business contract or business meeting you know to be anyway? So when you when you have those examples and you take these, those examples into consideration, you realize that Globish is not enough. So you need the right professionals. So actually there's, there's a lot of work for translators and interpreters today. It's just that it's different to before, and that's what I mentioned, the context of work have changed. There's more and more what, we, what has been labeled public service, community interpreting, for all these people who move around, you know, you move to a new country, there will be needs in education, in courts, in, in hospitals, in, uh, for interpreting services. In translation, same thing, people will need all sorts of things. But it's, it, it's happening at a, global, at, a, at a global scale as well. And that's where the technological aspect now comes, uh, comes into the picture. More and more words to be translated. Um, we want that fast. We want that to, oh, yesterday. You know, you want your translation yesterday. Um, and people are trying, of course, to, uh, to, to, to respond to this demand. And technology has shown through translation and memory and things like that, that in translators can uh, have a much higher output than they used to 20 years ago. Um, so how do, 
the, or how does the industry respond to that and in training institutions respond to that? I think um, many people are aware that translation memory is useful, that um, machine translation like Google and other can be useful. They can be terrible, but they can be useful. The whole thing is how do you use them? And so um, I've heard recently someone, for example, at the European um, uh, Parliament in the recruitment of translators saying that what we are after today are people with good, of course, language proficiency and knowledge, but also post-editing uh, competence and skills. Because we will use um, machine translation, but what you need to ensure if you use machine translation is that you're doing lots of post-editing uh, after, afterwards. So in some programs we are not necessarily encouraging the way or, or the use, if you want, of, of translation memory or, or of, transla of machine translation, but of translation memories, yes, but not of, of machine translation. But we are also encouraging training around, okay, this is the sort of product, product you get what do you do with this? And that's where the training of translators is different today. They have to know how to post it, to do some formatting, editing, and all these things. So um, I wouldn't be too worried with, uh, with, uh, with the fact that technology can, in a way, you know, help us. Uh, and I will see that as a help, uh, not as a threat. Uh, I do not think it will ever replace um, human, um, maybe in a few centuries, but I, I don't even think it might happen. I don't know. You know it's, there's still this need of, you know, the instruction is that you need to translate that Pavlova recipe for 10 year olds or 80 year old ladies. That's a very different thing, and a computer will probably not know how to do this. You know, so that's these things. I think we're safe for that, but we can use uh, translation technology. And people who say no are probably the ones um, that are left behind, certainly. So the idea in training, for example, and in research as well, is trying to observe how we can use that efficiently without being and feeling threatened and without being worried about 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 uh, the technology. I, I hope that answers, you know, and that covers your your your, your question. Yeah. Thank you. That that's a really helpful insight into the way in which these new trends and technologies are are being. Uh, embraced, reworked and put to use uh, by, by academia and by the industry. Thank you. As we begin to draw towards the end now, I'd, I'd like to come back to your own research and to ask you to talk a little bit about the way in which the, the, the research and the professional work that you do um, is helping and is helped by uh, your teaching. One, one of the things that, that we, we often seek to do, the, the holy grail, is, is to have a, a wonderful dovetailing between what we research and what we teach. And, and I imagine that, that in your case, there will be a lot of interesting things to say about that. Yes, absolutely. I'm very lucky in a way you know, to do research on education and training because I like being in the classroom. That's also something that, uh, that that's me. I like teaching. And, um, and the idea is that um, I'm trying to bring professional experience, mine or others, in the classroom. You know, we have lots of practitioners working with us uh, in the program. And, uh, and of course, trying to implement some of the things that we see and that we research on in the classroom. A classroom is a great lab, you know, you're a real alive or living laboratory, you know, you can use people, you can, sometimes they do not even know, but I was talking about the digital pen and the hybrid mode, you simply tell them, look, we are moving towards simultaneous interpreting, let's try to use the hybrid mode to see what, what we can do with this. So yes, I'm, I'm very lucky in that respect, is that what I do is what I research on, what I research on is useful in what I do every day and what I teach every day, and that's, uh, yeah, that's that's a very complementary and that's, that's great, you know, that's great for me, I, without any doubt. So I'm very lucky in that respect. Yeah. And as we look to the future, where are you hoping to take your research, say, in the next five, ten years? Um, so I've, I've, I'm, I'm now finishing the thing, the project on, on the digital band technology. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, and through that, I've been interested in context of work where uh, this technology could be useful. And one context I've realized, I've been approached by different people and I've read on it, is what we label humanitarian interpreting. Um, the use of interpreters in conflict zones, in disaster zones, in, you know, you've got a earthquake in Nepal, bang, hundreds of tourists, what are you doing, where are, are you getting your interpreters, how can we, you know, so there's lots of training in, um, in international organization, in NGOs, for what they call support staff, you know, when you have an emergency response unit deployed somewhere. What about interpreters? So I'm looking. I'm, I'm interested in looking at that. Um, you know, refugee camps, border protection, uh, conflict zone, disaster zones. It's not. It's, it doesn't seem very, very positive because it might be sometimes a little bit, you know, uh, harsh. But at the same time, I think there's a real need, as in the society, to sh clearly show that 
training is necessary as well for these people. Of course, in stress management, of course, but also in the techniques of interpreting, in the technology. People are on, field, on the field. If they have the right technology as well, that can be useful. So we are looking at this, and, and I'm very interested in looking at that at the moment. So that might be, uh, that might be one, one, one aspect that I'm going to explore in the, in the future. I haven't done any translation, or have, I do not have any translation project at the moment, and I'm not looking at it for any. Uh, but yes, I think that's the direction. Still exploring the different contexts and how we can train people better to provide the best service possible in those contexts and use that to research and to again explore new areas and maybe find uh, you know, new things and, and get new findings. Yes, surely. Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us that um, very engaging uh, insight uh, into the work that you do here at Monash. Marco Londo, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks.